Yes, we're live in the studios. There's multiple, I guess there's four studios. We're all in our home studios. Welcome everyone to another fun week of Tanzu Tuesday. How are you doing? Thank you. I know you're all responding vigorously on your Twitter chats. Long time no see. Agree, sweet killer nine. We were just speaking about you, in fact. Uh, your ears must have been burning, as it were. Uh, we were explaining to Dr. David Sire here that we have uh, some regulars and how fun it is to interact with them. So please, everyone, chime in, say he your hellos. We're so happy to have you back, and um, hopefully wherever you are, you're all healthy, safe, and uh, feeling in spry moods. Uh, as I said, we have Dr. David Sire with us. So welcome, doctor. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. How are you? I, I I do all right. Uh, yesterday, to, to put the cat out of the bag, it was my birthday, so it was a uh, a fun fun day with the family and uh, good food, and so it was. It was what nice. did you get? Uh, well, besides a T-shirt I told you about just a second ago that says <laughs> "pew pew pew," um, I got another one, which um, in Alameda and Oakland, the the naval yards, they have the cranes that take the yeah, cargo yeah, containers off, ones, yeah. and that kind of is what inspired the at at from star wars and so my sister found a cool t-shirt of that um i got actually it's I, i'm a star wars guy so i got a lot of star wars things okay. i got one of those like face masks that's the boba fett mask so when i go out in public <laughs> should have won it tonight i know so i should have did your kids also get presents when you got presents see there you go nice very nice no uh, <laughs> they did not they haven't they haven't learned that one yet no a little um, extortionist yeah, yeah. As Tiffany was mentioning, it was my son's birthday on Saturday. Uh, for a long time, I thought he and I were going to have the same birthday because he was uh, seven days late. He was a, a right. late baby. And so I was like, is he waiting to have a birthday with me? But uh, anyway, so my daughter, who's two years older, uh, also got like a couple presents to appease her for his third birthday because she, she, she turns five next month. So she's, anyway. But and it, that's it. So yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, this, whatever. His birthdays have been had, and uh, it was a lot of fun. So, and up oh, Spencer Gibbs on. Welcome, sir. Good to see you. Um, and then Hi, um, yeah, you, you, we had Spencer on last week. And if you haven't been able to see it, just like Sweet Killer and I mentioned, you can always go watch our sessions on the YouTube's. Just look up Tanzu uh, VMware Tanzu, and we have our own Tanzu Tuesday page with all of them, with the Josh Longs and Mark Hecklers and Jakob Pillamans and Nate Shooters. Just like you made your own video cassette. That's right. And we, we made our own mixtape. And so <laughs> uh, let me do a little bit of house cleaning first before we uh, get further into our discussions with you, good doctor. Uh, next week, uh, I will mention we have a couple things happening next week. First is the Spring One Tour, um, which Dr. David Sire has, and Spencer and many have been veterans of this tour that we normally do live in person in cities around the world uh but By sadly we can't so week, you mean the week after what's that and that's oh the week that's not next week it's right it is the week after <laughs> all right so it's that's right i forgot we, we 29th 30th yes it's 29th and 30th so not next week uh but it's 29th and 30th we've got the cicd experience kubernetes edition with our very own cora iberclyde who uh, has presented in this show she's part of the artanzu uh developer advocate team, which is amazing. She was extended another three months, so our hashtag keep Cora and advocate worked. And then uh, Andreas Evers uh, also will be co-presenting and they'll be doing a two-day event. Starts Wednesday the 29th at 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, goes till about 11. So it's a two hours, they're gonna do an overview and then a demo. And then the next day we're gonna do a fireside chat. And so if you have some questions, uh, you are welcome to present them and we will try and get to as many questions as we can with Cora and Andreas. Uh, and as far as I know, Andreas is going to be presenting from Belgium. So we'll have New York and Belgium wow. presenting, which is great. So uh, I think you gave Cora that, a, a miniature heart attack. Uh, she is, she is watching. Oh, she's like, oh, hi Cora. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> she didn't know. <laughs> apologies. Yeah. <laughs> we did push it. We did push it. Uh, next week is the Cloud Foundry Summit uh, that uh, VMware and many, many wonderful companies are a part of, helping to keep uh, open source communities going with these platforms as a service. And um, 
so the Cloud Foundry Summit, which we will have a lot of great presenters um, at, is go to cloudfoundry.org. Uh, they have their event. You can register and you can view the schedule and see who's presenting for the North American Cloud Foundry Summit. Again, that's the 24th and 25th of next week. Uh, oh, and you do have to register for that Spring One tour, which is Cora there a 24th have. and 25th of this week? <laughs> Did I say this week? I thought it was no, you said 24th and 25th of next week. And I'm like, is there a 24th and 25th? Oh, right. This There's week? only one 24th and 25th, which is, I'm just trying to emphasize that's next week. No, I'm just being Cora. a jerk. You are. And that's, <laughs> who, who invited keep, you? Keeping my toes on the fire. You did. <laughs> that's right. I did send the Zoom invite, didn't I? Dang it. Talk about an all time mistake. Uh, that's an awfully right. large right coffee you have. It's, but it's just water. But How can you tell it's coffee? Yeah, it's just water. But right. it, it's, it's a lot of volume and it keeps it cold. <laughs> um, we have our VMware uh, Tanzu developer page, tanzu.vmware.com slash developer. Check out that stuff. All of our shows, you can also get directly linked from our developer uh, TV portal section. Better yet, you Tanzu. can just go to tanzu.tv and that will take you Look straight at you. to Tanzu TV. Boom. Tanzu. No long URLs to remember, nothing. It's tanzu.cd. So I'm glad that we finally decided to make it dot easy. How much and did we pay for that? Then, right? I don't know. I mean, how much did I pay for it or how much <laughs> did they pay for it? Um, that's all I have for anything. Oh, and the spring one, the spring one uh, is going virtual September 2nd, through thir- 2nd and 3rd, excuse me. Go to springone.io and you can register for that. Again, all things spring. Dr. David, do you know if your talks have been accepted yet? Um, I'm trying <laughs> trying to stay out of it and oh, see what see what happens. Fair enough. I, I normally end up doing more than I want to at that show. So if I um, if I don't look interested, then I, I figure I might get to do just one. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so as we'll far as the talk, I might do something. I might do something like the talk I'm doing today. Actually, it wouldn't be a bad, wouldn't be a bad option. Yeah. But I haven't, haven't arranged it yet. I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm uh, well, sorry. I'm sure it, people will sorry, find Tasha. you as you. Yeah, as people will find yeah. you. <laughs> programming gets filled out. So yeah, we're currently uh, doing the programming right now. So I think it'll be probably at least another couple of weeks before we have it nailed down. By the yeah, way, are you leaning back in your chair, Paul? What's like because you look yes, like you're, like, looks like you're, you're looking, looking up straight up. At like, like, like a Please, can I be cat. a part of the show? Yeah, no, <laughs> I have, <laughs> I have the camera that. down low, so it's kind of looking up my nose. <laughs> Is it better if I hold it up? There you go. Yes. Welcome I, to the big boy show. I have quite a mess Paul. behind me, so I was trying not to show the mess, but. I have a virtual yeah. background anyway, so it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's a virtual mess. <laughs> yes. I was thinking that there's some paint that needs to be redone on that brick wall. <laughs> so, Dr. David Sire, uh, first and foremost, uh, question right out of the box. You got a doctor in front of your name. I know that you you have a doctorate. I forgot what it was in. So what, Allegedly. Yeah. What if if uh, I told I'm not calling you or am I? <laughs> Um, well, I don't use it much, but people like Josh go around calling me that, so it kind of sticks, I suppose. Um, you yeah, put it's on my like it's on my checkbook. I mean, how often do you use your checkbook these days? But, uh, yeah, rarely uh, if ever. <laughs> my PhD is in astrophysics. Look at I that! Oh, so the easy do. one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so well, you're like I mean, it's not just rocket harder, science. In, it is rocket science. So got it. Okay. <laughs> Well, cool. Yeah, I used to have a friend who's, uh, who actually was a rocket scientist, and uh, he used to go around saying it's not rocket science, and that was funny. Because it, it is. And uh, well, <laughs> that, that is amazing. I, I, I started my collegiate career as a physics, uh, astrophysics. Oh, cool. But, yeah. uh, There's a lot of that in tech, a lot of um, engineers and physicists. Yeah, Bob, Bob's That's problem is that he's right. colorblind, so he couldn't count the red shifts. Right. He thought it was a blue shift. Yeah. Just, everything was blue. And I was like, this Doppler <laughs> effect is only one. It's not even effective. Doppler. <laughs> uh, silly. Uh, well, excellent. So we should still call a doctor in case somebody injures themselves. We should still call like 911. Uh, yeah, don't call me. What is it in, what is the emergency in UK? Is it 911? 
Uh, you can use 911 now. Yeah, they internationalized it, but it okay. always used to be 999 uh, because of the rotary phone. It was the number that was the hardest to dial. So they, they, didn't, they yep. didn't want to, um, they didn't, you don't want to do it in accidentally and you can just keep your finger in, right? You don't have to fumble around for another number. So it was actually a good idea to have 999, but no, it didn't catch on. Nobody else used that. So. Yeah, in Australia, they use triple O for the opposite reason. They wanted to make it easy for you to right. dial. As quickly as, as possible. possible. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if you need it, it probably has to be easy. Yep. Well, these days, I mean, you can call it by putting your phone in your pocket quite easily anyway, can't right, you? That's right. It's an emergency call. <laughs> yeah. No, or your kid ratchet. just messing with your phone. In, in my case, like, stop touching the screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and, and how long have you been working on the spring team? Oh, golly. Um, 2006. We got a golly out of that, everybody. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a long time. A dedication. I didn't get my carriage clock yet. Or whatever you get, I don't know. For 15 years or 20 years or, yeah. I don't know, yeah. For I don't think anybody serve. got to that before. So. <laughs> right, they're like, you're, you're kind of uh, <laughs> on uncharted waters here. Well, there's yeah. Jürgen and there's Mark and there's uh, Ben. There's a few people still around from my days. but Right, but fewer than. Too many. Yeah. So that means you were around for the acquisition by vmware and then yeah if this is my second time around, around yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i kind of lost count i so i was interface 21 spring source vmware rubicon go pivotal because pivotal couldn't use pivotal at the beginning because of right. trademarks or something I don't that's know, what, yeah that's pivotal. what my amex had my amex had yeah. go pivotal on the bottom <laughs> pivotal vmware back again and you know what I'm, I think I'm going to get the Whoops. same email. <laughs> I think I'm going to get this. I was just holding up my VMware fingers. I okay. think I'm going to get the fi finally get the same VMware email address that I had last time. <laughs> they Which, did say I, IT said they couldn't do it. They said no, no, can't do, can't do that. Nobody gets the same email address. But it's done right because everybody's email address at VMware is first initial second name. So everybody tries to send me an email, and it. It doesn't get there because right. it's it's not desire at vmware.com anymore. It's something else. And, and you don't even know what it is. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what it is. That's right. <laughs> I think they've just agreed that they're going to give me it back. But well, good. I hope so. Yeah, exactly. And for the people out there that aren't familiar with uh, the British way of, of uh, saying go away people uh it's not the finger that he was holding up uh it's usually oh, no, two no, fingers. Not at all. No. and so uh no, this was my ring fingers when yes I oh you okay for, you had them low <laughs> you had them low so with my counting of... fingers i was trying to count on my fingers so yeah i can't but, even uh, remember where i got to I, either way we're going to get of... defunded on youtube because of this yes we are. <laughs> We've just been declassified Sorry. on Twitter. That, that three cents a year lasted. income we were generating yeah. from the ads on this TV uh, station. That's so sensitive. Gone. I know. I tell you, they won't ban fascists, but they'll ban me. My oh. daughter, um, my daughter did a really nice video of uh, like um, th uh, head banging to ACDC. So we filmed her doing that. It was hilarious. Like she was seven or something. It was completely harmless. She wanted to put it on video, but uh, on YouTube. But as soon as they went up there, they took it down because it had the soundtrack from the, the, the yeah, because of the music rights the or whatever. Band. Yeah, <laughs> they detected that. They were really clever at doing. That. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> and it probably would have had an audience of like two. <laughs> right, right. Oh, so just like yeah, this show. It. Yeah, just right. like this show. <laughs> <laughs> Something that your daughter and we, we have, have in common. <laughs> well, if she ever wants to come and headbang on Tanzu TV, she's more than welcome. That can double oh, our yeah, audience. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. She, it's definitely past her bedtime, so you'll right. have to, you know, reorganize right. the show a bit. And we'll, All right. we'll have to find some non-copyrighted music as well, but I'm sure we'll be <laughs> Yeah, We can make our own, you know. Concessions yeah, can be right, made. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well good all right well uh, do you uh tiffany or paul have anything to either ask david or or mention that i haven't in my kind of advertisements no i mean all my questions were so. going to be healthcare related and now i know he's not that kind of doctor <laughs> I'm, well, i got nothing <laughs> yeah and, and also this makes you means you can keep your shirt on and not ask him what this rash means well that is uh, true which... <laughs> 
by the way, I want to show off my shirt, the Make Jar Not War. I don't know if it And it's got a jar on it. See what we did there? But no war inside because you're not going to do that. (laughs) (sighs) Well, this has been really fun, and I can't wait to hear what you've got to present to us, Moon Doctor. So I say without further ado, share your screen, um, and away we go. I'm... I'm, you know, completely relaxed. Um, if I'm sure that there will be questions. I um, Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is an idea that's been brewing for a while, but I haven't actually talked about this in public <laughs> before. So this is first. Um, by the way, I do feel it is appropriate that you, I know you're a doctor of astrophysics, but physics, but that you have spring experiments and you're a doctor. And so I feel it's very on Yeah, it's sort of science isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, as, interestingly, astrophysics is the one science that you can't do experiments with, right? Because they're, all you can do is observe what's going on. You can't actually influence it. It's too far away. And as my friend's dad pointed out to me, as I was like all excited and gung ho, he goes, so you're basically just observing the past because yes. light takes that long to get to you, blah, blah. That's so you're right. more of a historian. And I'm like, come on, guy. It's not cool. <laughs> Anybody could do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks for reporting on what already happened a billion years ago. All right. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> Yeah, so you know, I, I carry this um, science persona around with me even after I've uh, been out of that business for some time. Um, anyway, yeah, so um, it was almost a keynote presentation actually at Spring One last year. It was kind of close, and then something else ended up being more important. So it's it's sort of an idea that I had a while ago, and um, Josh and I were going to talk about it actually um, last year, and then we never got around to it. So. I thought it'd be interesting to just sort of have a a bit of a retrospective on how things happen, right? How do, um, you know, how do products get created, but in specifically spring, spring products, um, projects and new open source work. Um, Cause it's, it's a bit like normal product management, but it's a bit different as well. You know, the way we do things because of the fact that it's all, all open source, for instance, makes things a bit different than, if you're, you know, creating and designing um, commercial products. And um, also there is this new, we set up a sort of, not it's not a formal process or anything. We don't kind of do things that way, but um, there's a new area in GitHub that we've been using for specifically for experimental work. So I thought it would be cool to just uh, have a closer look at some of the things that are going on in there as well. So, um, yeah, forgive me if I'm rambling, um, it's because I'm old. Um, that was the abstract that I gave Bob, so I'm not going to read it out, but, um, you know, why do we do some things and not other things? And, you know, what's the, what's the process? So if you have any questions, you know, um, related to that or anything, actually, I don't mind. I can uh, take time to, you know, have a chat. I'm not completely focused on <laughs> on um, only delivering slideware here. I'd, I'd be much more interested in actually hearing um, questions if you have questions. But um, just to uh, stimulate your thoughts and your interest, let's have a look at what's already there. So, okay, what is the Spring portfolio? We, 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 I don't know if we could still call it that, actually. We've called it different things over the years. Um, I remember quite early on, actually, sort of, um, before 2010, at least, anyway, before VMware, we had this term spring portfolio um, to describe the growing collection of um, spring projects. So, you know, it all used to be, I guess, when I joined 2006, it probably was already more than one jar file. But I could remember <laughs> when it was just spring.jar and then it just sort of grew and grew. And so we needed to sort of organize things a bit. And um, we didn't have GitHub in those days, of course. It was all just tucked away in subversion somewhere in SourceForge. Um, and eventually it has grown to the point that, look, in this GitHub organization here, we have 231 repositories. And so that is, you know, a small fraction of the number of actual jar files that are out there, which is kind of scary. 
Um, so, um, you know, not all of those are equally important and equally useful and equally well maintained, but there is a body of work there and there's probably a story about how it got there. Do you still manage um, any mirrors or anything back to the original SDN or SourceForge or anything? SourceForge? Hmm. I can't say for sure. Um, that I, I managed to dig up the pet clinic um, documentation page that was on our WordPress site from like 15 years ago, wow. um, a while ago. So that was still there somewhere. I think it might have been an internal site that I've dug out. Um, I don't think it's on the internet anywhere. Um, SourceForge, no, I think that's a dead thing, isn't it? Um, I'd be surprised. But I mean, the, the source code for the Spring Framework is literally, it has all the history going back to mm -hmm. the beginning. So um, they, they went from CVS to so, um, Subversion to Git, uh, Git, probably landed in Git about, I don't know, 20, 2011 maybe, I'm guessing. But the, the, the history goes back beyond before that, I think. Um, yeah, so um, there's a bunch of stuff in there. Spring Projects um, is an organization in GitHub where we um, arrange things and we don't really assign value or weight to them, but GitHub does, right? So GitHub has these things called stars and it measures the number of forks and things. So you can tell which are the sort of, you know, heavy, heavyweight objects in there. And it, the two that have, have been pinned by somebody on the team probably are the ones I would say that probably show up the most, light up the most lights, but there's a lot more there, of course. Um, there's also another organization called Spring Cloud, which um, I started a few years ago, and that has now got to 94 repositories and he knows five, six times that many jar files probably. Um, so, you know, there's quite a lot going on there as well. And most of those, I would say, probably are pretty active. Uh, <clears throat> so um, that's the story. So the and, last update um, on SourceForge was in 2013. Ah, well done. And it looked Thank like you. it was a release candidate for Spring Security. Yeah, right. Not Framework. But they probably switched over roughly the same time. I can remember sitting in... I can't remember where it was, um, sitting in a bar in Amsterdam, it was. So uh, the, the last time we had the Spring One Europe show was in Amsterdam. can't remember which year it was. might have been 2013. I can remember sitting in a bar talking to Mark Thomas and saying, oh, there's this great thing called Git. You've got to try it out. And he was going, nah, I don't think so. Nah, I can't see the point. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> now, if you want to hear and a really scary actually, thing, there were 124 downloads of Spring Framework from SourceForge this week. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that is scary. I'm even surprised that you can look it up. That's amazing. Yeah. It was probably it was probably all Spencer though. I think he still uses it. <laughs> yeah, there's one guy still using it. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious, actually. Yeah. Um, a small fraction of the downloads from Maven Central, of course, very small, but yeah, cool. Thank you for that. Um, so, um, actually, you know, one of the things that people complain about the most about Spring and, you know, Spring Cloud, Spring everything is there's too much of it. <laughs> and, you know, you can't, you can, you can see the point really. There's sometimes there is, uh, uh, you can have too much of a good thing. Um, and it's quite hard to know, you know, what's related to what and how they all fit together. So that's, you know, something that we think about a lot. Um, I can't say what what we what we're um you know i can't say that we're all that successful in solving that problem for people but we do think about it and we try um one of the things we tried was um sort of arranging things in pictures and I, this is one of the pictures that i liked um this is from a, a spring one keynote um when would it be 20 14 maybe 15 something like that um where it shows the, it was Brian Dussault's idea, I think, drawing it as a tree. So you've got this sort of big root system 
at the bottom, which is all third party dependencies and it's all kind of unseen, but that's where the important stuff is actually. Um, it, everything else builds on top of uh, existing libraries, basically third party dependencies. And then Spring Boot, uh, Spring Foundation is what in those days we were trying to call the Spring for Portfolio. So we've had different names for it, but that's the you know Spring Framework, Spring Security, Spring Data, all of the core projects. And then Spring Boot sits on top of that and spring cloud starts to come in on the branches and spring cloud in this picture is kind of um, visualized as a bunch of things that glue apps together so that's kind of the role that spring cloud plays and the apps themselves are like the sort of foliage of the tree um and, you know i thought that was quite a good image um i haven't seen that since but i thought it was worth trundling that one out just in case people um could latch onto it again and another thing you might do is just uh, try and measure the dependencies, right? So what what depends on what? And this is and nobody's going to be able to read that, and they're not supposed to. <laughs> it's uh, it's quite a complex diagram. This is all the dependencies in Spring Boot, um, but all collapsed down to the project level. So everything with Spring in the name which has its own GitHub repository, basically. So you can see Spring Boot is the sort of nexus at the top there. And that's Spring Framework with everything pointing to it, obviously. Reactor at the bottom has a lot of things pointing to it. Lots of things depend on Reactor. Spring Data Commons, because Spring Data has a lot of um, projects that all have common behavior, so they all point to the same thing. And, um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to sort of give a visual impression in case anybody, uh, you know, um, was interested. And if there's any details that you'd like to call out, then uh, ask me about it. Um, the next one's going to scare you, though. So this is <laughs> this is the same thing, but including Spring Cloud. And I literally couldn't I couldn't fit it on the slide. Like um, this is Google Slides, and it literally wouldn't let me paste that image into it. It it was too much <laughs> so it um it vomited and i had to um degrade the image to such such a to the point that even if i zoomed in you wouldn't be able to read those names but I, this is um the spring boot um, node here so everything on top of that is basically spring cloud so you can see things like spring cloud commons has a lot of connections coming into it that's just a dependency that all spring cloud projects use and most people don't need to know it's there. It's kind of a bit like Spring Data Commons. Um, and then the rest of it at the bottom is what like it was on the previous slide, Spring Framework at the bottom there, Spring Data Commons, yeah. Um, the red lines are cycles that we detected when we <laughs> drew this. When, when I first saw this diagram, my eye was immediately drawn to this one, um, even before it was red. And then I said to Andy Wilkinson, who made the picture, can we try and find the cycles? Um, because we don't want cycles right there. They're, they're going to cause problems because you can't release anything. You know, um, they're chasing each, each other's tails around this uh, dependency graph. That's not Th bad. That you only problem... have, what, two cycles there? Yeah, two minor cycles. Yeah, this one no longer exists. I don't. That one's gone. Um, we managed to get rid of that one. That was an accident anyway. So this is, um, let me see if I can remember spring cloud function is sitting there um, spring cloud task is here and spring cloud streams no spring, no spring cloud function it was fun, oh, spring cloud it must be spring spring cloud function spring cloud task and spring cloud streams I think it was yeah that's what it was yeah because spring cloud streams now depends on spring cloud function but it used to be the other way around when it was the other way around, then there wasn't a cycle and nobody noticed when it when we flipped that, nobody noticed that there was this other, um, other, what's it called, edge in the graph. So only, you know, when you do a bit of data analysis, you find the, uh, you find the problems and you can, then you can fix them. So that one I think is fixed. This one is, I don't know if they fixed that one. I'd certainly like to see it fixed. It's, it's an old one. Um, I've sort of known about it for quite a long time, but it's sort of hadn't really um, <clears throat> hadn't really been bothering anyone. I mean, they're, they're not so serious in the sense that you've got jar files that chase each other around. You can't 
you can actually build apps using these dependencies because each blob in this diagram is a collection of jar files so you know a line an arrow between two blobs here doesn't mean that every single jar file is connected to every single jar file on the other side so that, that you can resolve these cycles in various ways by changing the granularity but um it'll still be quite good to get rid of this because it sort of affects the way that you can release things right so you have to you have to release one of those things. You have to start somewhere in that cycle and then <clears throat> release everything. And when you get back to the beginning, you have to admit that you made a mistake basically and either start again or just you know make sure there's no inconsistency when you get around to the other side of the cycle. So it's a little bit difficult to administrate. This one is um, Spring LDAP basically. Spring LDAP has a nice, a, a nasty knot with Spring Batch and Spring Security. So Spring Security depends on Spring LDAP because of you know Active Directory and storing user details in LDAP. And Spring Batch has a dependency or should have a dependency in LDAP, but they did it the other way around. So the guys who were writing Spring LDAP, it was originally a community project. It wasn't from um, Spring source of VMware, or whatever you called it at the time. Um, so those they, those guys were really interested in batch, and they wanted a feature, so they implemented it in their projects instead of putting it in Spring Batch. So we, they created this cycle like I don't know over a decade ago, I should think, and it's been there ever since. I think we're addressing it, but I, I wouldn't like to wouldn't like to <laughs> wouldn't like to give you a timeline on that or anything. Sort of interesting bit of history. I did say I would probably ramble on a bit, didn't I? Is there an um, interactive map of that somewhere that someone who was interested could go and kind of click um, through and dive into various pieces? It's not really interactive. It's literally just, I, it, we could make one. I'm pretty sure somebody would be smart enough to take the data and put it into a, you know, a JavaScript yeah. interactive thing. Might be worth doing. I don't know. I mean, um, it's um this there might be some there's nothing sort of you know private or you know alarming in there or anything there's nothing that we wouldn't mind being public it's just i don't know where we'd put it mm -hmm. um but we are i mean we are always thinking about this problem like i said so we're always thinking about how to present the um the projects in the website for instance in spring spring.io we're always looking for better ways to present them so we might be able to use this dependency information just to sort of help people to, you know, follow the links. Like if you right. if you were using this, maybe you'd be interested in using that because it's look, it's connected. Or mm -hmm. you, you sort of need a bit more weight, right? You need a bit more data than just connections for that. You need to know, you know, what the um, some, you know, some importance I think of the of the connections as well. But it's interesting stuff, right? So I thought I'd throw it up in case it was. Uh, interesting in case uh, in case people had questions so thank you paul um the next slide i haven't showed to anybody so i'm probably going to get roasted for it um i uh, it's all completely subjective so i don't have any access to grind here i'm not trying to prove any points i just thought um what could tell a story um and what have I noticed about the way that projects and products get created in the Spring portfolio? And one thing I've definitely noticed over the years is the horizontal axis. So sometimes we do things because you just have to do them. You're just, you just, you know, scratching an itch. Somebody really just has to solve that problem. Um, and sometimes that's because there's a, you know, community crying out for it. And sometimes it's, it usually is, um, it's more often you know also connected with some personal experience that somebody's had like yeah, they really they really really want to fix that because they've had done that thing so many times and got sick of doing it so the scratch and itch and there's plant a flag so where you lead the way um let's you know go and do this because nobody's done it before and maybe that will be a good reason for people to do it in the future and um in my my observation is that that's not necessarily a good strategy <laughs> for building good products. Um, there are some things that are, you know, not completely on the left hand side that are very successful and very interesting, like Spring Web Flux, for instance. I put it in the middle there. Aspect J, not many people use it, but it's, you know, it's, it's old, venerable technology. You can't really say anything too bad about it. It still works, it's still really good at what it does. Um, that was sort of 
leaderish, right? It, nobody was, um, it was, I mean, the people who invented it will probably uh, tell me I'm completely wrong there, but it, it was definitely something that um, as a technology, a lot of people didn't know they needed <laughs> until it until they saw it kind of thing. Um, and that definitely applies more as you go towards the right hand side of this graph of this diagram. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about Spring Web Flux, so it's maybe worth calling that one out. I would say that was um, fairly successful. Yeah, I put it, you know, quite a long way up the top of the uh, the graph here. Um, maybe not the most used features in the Spring Framework, even though we talk about it a lot. Um, and there, there's the rub, right? So we talk about it a lot. So we have kind of pushed it a little bit. We've seen the need. We've seen that people will want Spring Web Flux, but we have to also we have to educate them that they need it. <laughs> so it's a little bit to the right of this diagram, just because it wasn't something that people were breaking down our door for. Is my impression, at least. Anyway, I'm sure you know that there are other <laughs> other opinions um, in the team, and I'd be quite happy to uh, debate that with somebody <laughs> at some point in the future. Um, there are some. Um, dead projects on this diagram. So DM server, I think is probably uh, as good as dead, if not completely, unless somebody's still downloading it from SourceForge, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, Spring Social was a thing for a while and that was scratching an itch. Like that was, um, you know, let's try and, let's try and build Java APIs for every single social site out there, Twitter, Facebook, GitHub, blah, blah, blah. And it was just, the surface area was too big. We just couldn't cover it. So there was one guy who was really enthusiastic about it and <laughs> nobody else really cared. So um, that was scratching an itch, but it wasn't in the end very successful. And I think we've um, put that in the attic now. So we have this thing called the attic. So that's the first time I've mentioned that, but there are, uh, there are, categories of um, Spring projects, even in the Spring projects GitHub organization that I just showed you, where they're a little bit of backwater, but they're still alive. They're not actually in the attic yet. Spring Social is in the attic. It was for a while in the normal Spring projects repo. It stayed there for a few years. It's now moved. So there's a, a, a different organization called uh, Spring Spring Attic or Spring Projects Attic, I'm not sure which. There's also a Reactor Attic. Um, so there are, you know, we have those places that we put projects that we don't think uh, people are going to use anymore, basically. And sometimes we manage to um, stop maintaining things as well. So Spring Roo is one of those. So that was sort of an itch. That was um, Ben Alex's idea, and he thought it was, um, you know, he, he thought it was really solving a problem, and not enough people agreed with him so it didn't end up going up to the top of this diagram um, and it's no longer maintained by the spring engineering team but it is somewhat alive at least anyway some people still use it um, anything else so any um, interesting questions now do we need to make a statement about this not being an official Gartner magic oh, it's absolutely so not sued? official no this is just right. they we're just shooting the breeze yeah. right I'm drinking a drinking a glass of wine here um, so Gartner, if you're out there, if you ever see this, please don't get mad. Uh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, what yeah. kind of wine? I don't know any, who Gartner? Who are they? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I just uh, I thought it was just a sort of interesting exercise, and yeah. so there's no value assigned to yeah. any position in this diagram. Um, it was just sort of interesting to see how my impression you know how things fell and i didn't mm -hmm. you know i didn't do this do it scientifically in any way i didn't choose all the projects would have just been too much work <laughs> um and so I, I cherry picked the ones that i was interested in and then i kind of arranged them in a pseudo random fashion on the diagram so that i can just talk about them well i think that's how Gartner clearly... does them too <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to get us in trouble <laughs> Yeah, right. <clears throat> well, I suppose if I ever need a job. Um, yeah, so that brings me to um, another GitHub organization. So the one where we have recently designated um, this is where new things will live. And it is quite recent. It's only been there, I don't know, a year or something. Um, 
hence it only has currently 15 repositories, um, one of which is already in the attic. Um, so, and the reason for that is just that it was Spring Data JDBC basic, no Spring Framework, was it? No, Spring, it was Spring Boot R2DBC, the um, relational database access thing. So the, the thing, the features that went into Spring Boot 2.3 basically incubated here first and Spring Boot 2.3 is now released. So there's no need to keep the repo here and it's it's got a label on it. It hasn't actually been moved into an attic yet. It's got a label that says um, retired or something on it. Um, so there are 15 there and I thought um, I'd pick a few and just, you know, um, share with you what's going on there um, in case there's some interest or questions or anything, I could go into more detail. I could also probably quickly demonstrate a couple of them at least. What's the time? Yeah, we've probably got time to do that. Um, so the ones I picked were um, the one that was on the screen there, Spring Graal VM native. Um, so that's um, a newish project. It's been there for um, less than a year, I'd say. Um, it started in Andy Clement's personal GitHub pages. That's that's the way we used to do things. Basically, people would just start things in their own GitHub organization and just hack on them until they kind of either died or survived. Um, this one survived um, at roughly the time that Spring Experiments was being set up. So we migrated it over there as soon as we thought that we were going to have a release, basically. Um, so um, I've been involved with this one. Uh, I haven't been involved with all of these, but I've chosen a few that I was involved in just because I'll know more about it if anybody's interested in the details. Um, so as you may know, Graal, Graal is a collection of um, different products, different uh, things from Oracle um, to do with polyglot programming. Um, so different languages running on a JVM basically to do with um, garbage collection. So there's a garbage collector written in Java, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, allegedly quite good for running Scala. And there's also this thing called native images. So you can build a binary executable from uh, a Java program. So therefore a Spring Boot application in principle. And the good thing about those is they start very fast. So, you know, usually 100 milliseconds or less. Um, Depends how big the application is, of course. I mean, I'm sure you could find a native image that would take 10 seconds to start, but you'd have to look you'd have to look quite hard for one, put it that way. Um, and they do also they tend to have um, a lower memory footprint than a full JVM because, frankly, they're not doing as much as a full JVM, and so they make less assumptions about what they might have to do. Uh, when the going gets tough, so um, those two things sort of make them at least in principle, economically appealing, right? It means that you can scale fast and you don't have to pay as much for your, you know, the memory that you're using. I would imagine a lot so, of the call then for that would be around the serverless slash, you know, function as a service serverless area. Serverless is a big consumer, at least in principle, yeah, starting fast oh. being the watchword there. So a yeah. lot of serverless platforms allow you to scale to zero. Right. So you don't pay for it if you're not actually running yeah. Um, and so, well, I mean, you know, you do have to think about whether it matters, right? So, um, right. starting fast matters if you care about latency mm -hmm. in that case. Um, Which is mostly, so I would doing, think if there's a person at the other end of the results. I was going to say, yeah, if, if you're, if you have a user waiting for something, then you care about it. Yeah. If it's background processing, you know, um, batch processing, transaction processing overnight, that kind of thing. And I don't really think you care that much. It doesn't matter so much. Mm -hmm. the, the point, I suppose the point of having that debate is it's not free, <laughs> right? You can build these nice binary images from Java programs, but um, there are some restrictions. It actually takes quite a lot of memory and time to build the image itself, right? So <laughs> I think Phil um, Webb made this crack um, quite early on in this process where he said, so so you can run a pet clinic in 100 milliseconds, but it takes you 10 minutes to build it. So 
how many <laughs> how many slow starts of a JVM could you do in the time it took you to build <laughs> one right. image? And so it, if you don't spend a lot of time going up and down, like if you don't mm -hmm. start a lot of new processes, then it, it might not be worth the effort, frankly. Yeah, and I would imagine um, there's an interesting stuff you could do with like circuit breakers and back pressure and stuff to like fill in bits of the user experience while you know some of the stuff starting up yeah so I, no, I feel like I there's mean, people probably yeah. plenty of ways to solve that without Demand going well too be, crazy yeah i've been i've been playing with um i've been playing with azure microsoft azure functions recently mm -hmm. and um they I've, I've used lambda a lot before but i haven't used azure very much azure has a very different billing model um and so they have, um, and it's much more um, finely grained and much more structured. And so in particular, one thing you can do is you can just pay them for a premium tier plan for your functions. And basically they never scale down. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it doesn't matter if it's on a, um, a, a slow cold start because you never see a cold start, literally never. And you pay a little bit more for that, but I mean, it's still, um, you know, it's th there is a price point, right, at which somebody will pay for that. So, you know, you just have to um, be creative sometimes. Uh, however, yeah, I mean, the um, the, the um, scaling up fast is an advantage if you have, like you said, um, latency sensitive users. And in particular, if you have big spikes up and down, right, if you have right if you have to cope with big spikes then it's almost impossible to predict ahead of time if you have lots of cold starts you have a really really slow cold starts mm -hmm. it's almost uh, impossible to start up enough you know reservoir to uh, to um, blot out the incoming uh, spike and if you can't start fast enough so there's there's there are use cases where it's definitely very important which is why of course you know we're working on it here um, so, I mean, native images, really interesting feature from GraalVM. There's another new thing as well in um, Oracle and the, um, uh, the OpenJDK team have come up with another thing for building native images called Project Leiden, which they are saying is going to be part of Java 15, we'll, we'll see. Um, but it just goes to show there's, you know, there's quite a lot of interest in this. Um, there are clearly things going on in Lambda and Azure where they're, you know, they have very good quotes, cold start times. So they're not actually starting processes from scratch. They're doing, they're, they're holding things in some sort of suspended state. And so there's lots of different approaches to solve this problem, but this is definitely an interesting one. So we're, we're keeping our, um, our, our eyes on it. Spring 5.3 is probably going to be the sort of, you know, sweet spot for getting this working for kind of, you know, the the work a day Spring Boot applications. Most things will be at least approachable. Not everything will work, but and most things you'll be able to find something that will be able to turn it into a, a native image, we think. Um, and native images are not actually... Um, generally available from Oracle yet. Yeah, it's still an experimental feature for them as well. So it, it definitely lives in this spring experiments for a reason. So there's that, that's very active. Um, there's quite a few of us working on it at the minute. Um, we're doing lots of cool things like trying to hack away at bits of Tomcat, for instance, because there's all sorts of places. And it's Tom, Tomcat's a very old code base. So it's sort of tangled, it's a big, um, you know, interconnected mess sometimes and so we're trying to pick that apart a bit and um, stop it from needing xml libraries for instance so it's got xml everywhere and xml is nice for some things but you don't need it most of the time for a spring boot application so why would you need the libraries on the class pass and they basically take up a lot of memory um, every time you initialize them so there's lots of you know things where we're chipping away at the edges there should be good for everyone um, yeah, so the second one is um, the one I already mentioned, actually, the one that is, which is archived, not attic'd. Um, archived is a much better word. I couldn't, re couldn't remember what it was. So if you look in the GitHub repo, you'll find there's a label on it, 
I didn't even know you could do that. You can label a GitHub repo and it, it shows up on the, um, the list in the GitHub UI there. So that's the thing that turned into uh, RTDBC support in Spring Boot. And um, yeah, it was mostly Mark working on that, I guess, and uh, maybe a couple of the Spring Boot team, Mark Paluk. And that was gestating for a few months, maybe up to a year, I don't know. And then it went into Spring Boot 2.3. So it's kind of turned the corner and, um, and dropped off to archived status. The third one is one of my pet projects. So <laughs> I had to put it there just to give it a bit of limelight. Um, I started that a long time ago. So um, I wrote it with Spring Boot 1.3, I think. Uh, I don't even know when that was, but a few years ago. Um, and so the idea with this is that uh, there's a lot of wasted bandwidth with transporting fat jars around, right? So you've got, if you're running two applications and they mostly have the same dependencies, they you, you basically got 60 megabytes of, of stuff that you have to transport around and dump in a, on a disk somewhere and then run them. And also, you know, tragically, I think this is the worst thing about them. Fat jars go into, you know, storage in um, binary storage in, uh, you know, Artifactory and Nexus and places like that, bin tray. And it's a complete waste, right? Because it's you've duplicated so many bytes. Um, so I thought there must be a better way to do it. Um, so let's make an executable jar. I like executable jars. Um, that you know, has a reproducible binary experience. I can run, if I run it in two places, it's gonna give me the same results, but which don't carry around all of their dependencies. So um, the idea is that it downloads the dependencies at runtime. It's sort of inspired a little bit by the Maven and Gradle wrappers that you put in your project build. So there's a really tiny, maybe one class uh, libraries that know how to go and download Maven and know how to go and download Gradle and they get you started basically. So it's a bit like that. I, I assume um, at runtime, also... you mean it will go and collect them all at like initial runtime or when those dependencies well, are Well, you can required? choose. So you can, you could do it um, in a Cloud Foundry, for instance, if you run a, a thin, boot, thin launcher jar in, in Cloud Foundry, it will download the dependencies at staging. So before mm -hmm. it gets to the, um, after the jar has been uploaded and before it's actually hits the right. container full. Um, so you could do that, you know, in a CI process, you could do it in a sort of, you know, build step. So you could build the jar file, send it to your repository for, you know, binary reproducibility, and then you could have a build my dependencies, build my container step, basically. So you could, you know, uh, do that. And one of the features I built into it, which uh, if I have time, I'll um, maybe show you is, um, it's a really neat way to compute a class path. So you can show it a jar file and say, tell me what the class path is for this jar file and also download it, right? That's, that's well, as a side effect. Um, and then I added a feature called profiles, which is a bit like Maven or Spring profiles. So you can say, um, so the default profile is a Spring Boot application, shall we say, for the sake of argument with Tomcat and a few endpoints and nothing else. And then you could have a profile for actuators and say, if you use the actuator profile, then I want you to add the actuators. And if you use the RabbitMQ profile, then I want you to use RabbitMQ. And if you use the, I don't know, um, Prometheus profile, then I want you to add the Prometheus jars so that you can start you know, distributing metrics. And so all of those are sort of, cross-cutting concerns, right? They're things that you might not care about when you're writing your business logic, but you can sort of layer them on afterwards. And I find it quite sad that I haven't been able to get anybody else excited about this, but it does have um, you know, a few interesting use cases and it has a few users, people use it, um, but not a huge number yet. So it's still sitting here in spring experiments waiting for some love. <clears throat> Um, yeah, we're running out of time, aren't we? So um, I don't know if I'm going to end up doing any demos at this point, but that's okay. Um, the next one is um, a, also relatively recent, I reckon. It's probably been there a year. Um, Sebastian Deleuze started this one, so it was probably in his GitHub repo to start with, and then it moved into Spring Experiments. So this thing is basically a DSL for building Spring Boot applications. So instead of using 
at configuration. There are no annotations and there's no auto configuration. So you don't at enable auto configuration. You don't just have at Spring Boot application. You literally write a Java program that adds features. It says, okay, I want Netty, I want Webflux, I want Jackson, and I want these endpoints. And it's all sort of explicit on the page for you. So some people like that. Um, especially people who, you know, come from other frameworks and other languages. So that's important. Um, and also it plays very nicely with this native image thing, because um, <clears throat> one of the things that interferes with native images a lot is um, reflection and, um, you know, introspecting classes and building proxies and all of those things that Spring likes to do. Um, in its annotation driven pr pr programming model, but this is completely annotation free. So um, it has a pretty good chance of making optimal um, low memory footprint of starting faster native images. Even if you could build a Spring Boot app with annotations, <clears throat> what you can, and then build a native image out of it, you'll probably get a smaller, faster one if you use Spring Foo. So that's there's sort of a tie in there. And another tie-in um, is with this very new thing that um, I think has got a less than 50% chance of living, frankly. But it's my project, so I'm going to um, <laughs> I'm going to blow its trumpet a little bit. Um, Spring in it is is also sort of inspired a little bit by the um, uh, Spring Foo, Spring Grail Native, those that family of things, um, because what it does is it it takes your annotations. So the premise with Spring Init is that you like to use annotations, but you don't like to pay the cost of them at runtime. So you want to use the annotations to build something else, which is more efficient, lighter weight, compiles better to native code, that kind of thing. And um, if you looked at what, so it's actually code generation. It's, um, it's an annotation processor. So it, at compile time, it looks at your code, your annotations, and it turns them into um, functional bean definitions, it turns them into functional Java code. So it actually turns it into something that is consumable by Spring Foo, interestingly. And one of the plans that we have with Spring Foo is to sort of either merge these things together or just consume Spring in it in Spring Foo. So Spring Foo becomes a, a, a client, or Spring in it becomes a dependency of Spring Foo so that Spring Foo can cover all of the auto configuration features that Spring Boot has without having to write any actual code because we've auto generated it. So that's kind of the, the hope that we'll get to with that. Um, so rather than doing demos, I'll just um, quickly um, wind through a few slides. I mean, if you want, and, if you wanted uh, to do a demo, I think we have time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I might do one. How about that? I'm not gonna. Yeah. I'm not gonna. Not, I'm not gonna knock it out of the park because it's late here and I, sure. I don't want to get to bed. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. So I was gonna tell a story about Spring Reactive because it might be interesting. It was on that, you know, um, quadrant slide earlier on. Um, so Spring Reactive was a project that was started by Ian Paltzman, and so that's his you know, personal web, web uh, organization and GitHub and the code as it is today, hasn't had a commit for four years. And the reason for that is, although it started in 2015, so there's his first three commits, they look, you know, excellent commit, git commit log there. So we can all see what he's done really clearly. <laughs> it didn't matter, right? Because all this code just got merged without its history into spring. So, um, the first commit was in 2013, actually, for Reactor Spring. That was a sort of part of the Reactor project, which goes back ooh, you know, probably a couple of years before that as well, probably 2010, 2011. Um, and there was a Spring component to it. And then that kind of morphed into a few ideas that Ian was kicking around. And um, that first went into sort of prototype mode in the middle of 2015. I remember at Spring IO 2016, we were demoing it. And I remember Sebastian and Brian and um, Stefan Maldini probably was talking about it there as well. Um, they had workshops and stuff at the conference. At that point, we hadn't even got to a milestone of um, Spring 5, but we were quite 
clear that this was going to be a thing. So um, we were flagging it quite early there in 2016. So there's the first milestone. Um, the release date was actually 20, end of 2016. So you can see it took two or three years, really, gestation um, to get Spring Web Flux. And, um, you know, it's, it's top notch, right? I mean, it's, they did a really good job in the end. Um, you shouldn't take this kind of thing slowly, I suppose. Um, they um, they took their time to think about it, and there was a reason for that. That's the way they do things. Um, okay, one slide for each, um, and then maybe uh, why don't we have a poll? We can decide which demo to do. <laughs> so Spring Girl Native, that's what it looks like. You can compile something to a native image, like a pet clinic. The pet clinic um, is actually out of the box pet clinic now, and it runs in about 300 milliseconds. I've seen it run a bit faster, but that's probably on average a good day, I should think. Sometimes it's slower than that. It's quite variable, uh, frankly. I don't really understand why. So that's a native binary image Spring Pet Clinic. Um, Spring Boots in Launcher. So you make a package with Maven, then you look at the jar file and you see that it's only 10 kilobytes. Okay, now that 10 kilobyte jar file is a simple app that has probably Netty, I don't know, it's a Webflux app, I think. Um, so that's one of the samples from this project, Spring Boot Thin Launcher, has a sample called Simple. Um, Spring Foo, so that it has two flavors. Um, one is Kotlin, this is the Kotlin. So this Kotlin app has um, a Webflux section, it has two beans that are not part of Webflux, so two user supplied um, components, a sample service and a sample handler. And <clears throat> I guess the handler uses the service and that's kind of off the screen. So there's a bit more code that I'm not showing, but this is the DSL for configuration, right? So this is saying, here are two beans. Um, I want you to use Webflux. I want you to use this port. I want you to use these routes. So there's a route for the uh, homepage and a route for an, a slash API. And I want you to be able to handle strings for the home page and Jackson um, serialization, deserialization for the API. And it's all bish bash bosh, it's all there on the screen. There's a Java version, which um, Sebastian nearly gave up on, but I think we can um, persuaded him to go back to it. So now there is a, a Java DSL back again in the Spring Foo project. It looks a bit busier, so he, he doesn't like it because he likes beautiful things like that. Um, in some ways, I prefer this because <laughs> I can, uh, you know, my old brain just kind of um, processes that more easily. It isn't actually, it's a little bit uglier, isn't it? But it isn't actually a lot more code, to be honest, once you've got lambdas and everything. Um, so that's the Java version of the same thing. It's just a bit more. Uh, a bit less stylish, I suppose, because you have to put all these dots in. So everything has to follow on with a dot, whereas with the Kotlin version, it's sort of a bit more open, I suppose. But it's exactly the same, exactly the same app. You can probably tell. Um, and then finally, um, spring init, it looks like this. So if, I, if you started with an app configuration class like this, with one at bean called foo, then it would generate for you at compile time this thing, which is an application context initializer, which then um, does a quick if check. Have, I, have you got this already? If not, then register an instance of this. There's some debate about whether we need to do that or not. Clearly, we don't in this case. But in general, you can't always tell because this is generated code. So it's sometimes it's hard to reason about whether you need to create a bean of the type um, given by the kind of configuration class, which is kind of a factory. And then you register the thing you're interested in, which is a foo, and foo is created from a supplier of foo here, basically. So context get bean, sample configuration, foo. Um, so that's all generated. So you, you don't have to ever write that code. Um, you just, you know, may even package it or in its, you know, in your class path at runtime. And then Spring init has the job of collecting together all the app configurations and um, just, you know, stitching together the initializers basically in the same way that um, configuration class pro pro processor does. There's a, a 
we switch that off and spring in it and we bring in something that does it with initializers instead. So that is, I believe, the end of the slide deck. Um, yes. So um, unless somebody tells me to do something else, I'm going to do one demo, which will be, let's see what I've got on my screen. <clears throat> Actually, nothing at the moment. So um, I will do. Well, let's do spring in it since you said that's your. Uh, uh, that's that's, one that's of your my things. baby at the minute. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All you right. said there's a fifty percent chance uh, it won't survive. So maybe. Yeah. I maybe think we can give it a, a forty, <laughs> uh, like a fifty-one percent chance by. Uh... We we kept yeah. Cora around. The, the power of the internet. <laughs> we have plus two live people watching. So, you know, let's Thank keep you. it going. <laughs> Just for a few minutes. Okay, so I'm uh, starting up the... Do, do we need to go to Josh's uh, second favorite uh, place on the internet that. to start? <laughs> start dot spring. Dot io. Dot io. Dot uh, sweet, sweet killer nine well, still I here? I could do it that way. Spencer, Spencer Gibb is uh, celebrating his six-year anniversary today, so he's still watching. Let's do it. Oh, is he? That's good to know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've got some samples here. If you looked in the project in GitHub, you would find these samples. Um, and they are trying to cover a range of different features. Oh, is this the right thing? Uh, no, this, I'm looking at this thin launcher. This is thin launcher samples. Hang on. Let me just bring up the right the right IDE. I don't know what that means. Oh, oh that doesn't make sense. Ah, oh, that's it, is it? OK. Yeah, I think it was probably just another, another window running. I'm sorry. Feeling a bit dozy. All right. So um, this is the pet clinic from Spring in it in the samples. Um, it's just a normal normal pet clinic. It literally is the pet clinic that you get when you download the big pet clinic from the internet. And um, all I had to do with it to make it a Spring in it project was I had to. This is normal Spring pet clinic foot stuff, I had to do this. I had to add um, a couple of dependencies that are funk dependencies. So they're Spring Boot auto configure. Um, there's probably, a, yeah, there's probably an actuator one somewhere as well. I'm looking. Uh, maybe there isn't. Uh, oh, maybe I do that in a profile, could be. Yeah, anyway, so um, the general picture is you have Spring Boot already, and you add another jar file, which has all of the initializers in it, the things that were generated from Spring Boot. So that's one sort of open question is whether we continue to do that, or you know, packaging it as separate jar files, or when maybe we should just merge them together. It's, it's quite a lot of extra code. It's probably not as big as Spring Boot auto configure on its own, but it's you know a significant fraction of that. So we might want to continue to <clears throat> separate them. Um, and then you have an extra dependency on Spring init core. And I think sometimes and not always Spring init library. So Spring init core is the thing that um, basically changes the programming model. So instead of using configuration class post processor, it's going to uh, look at your sources and find the initializers and call the initializers instead of creating proxies for at configuration or calling the bean methods. So um, once you've got that, then um, you also need one other thing. I assume I'm going to find it somewhere, probably in the Plugins, Come on. here we go, compiler plugin. OK, there it is. So there's a, an annotation processor, spring init processor. So that thing creates initializers from your code. 
right? So the pet clinic application here has generated a pet clinic application initializer. Hope everybody can see that. And the structure of that is pretty predictable. It's basically all of the things that were in the component scan from the pet clinic. So this pet clinic lives in a package with sub packages and each of these sub packages has things like at controller in it and at controller is an owner control. That's one, that one's an owner controller. So let me just uh, bring that back up. Where is it? Uh, let me just keep closing it. The owner controller is here. Um, so there, so, um, that one, that one just registers a bean by its class, actually. So that's a pretty simple pattern. But there are, I don't know, four or five different idioms, basically, for registering functional bean definitions. That's the simplest one, which is um, effectively just going to do uh, call the constructor when the, when the time comes for it to be needed. All this is generated. It could be generated in different ways, I suppose. But um, we've made some choices in Spring in it. Um, all of the Spring Boot auto configurations have basically corresponding classes like that. And that means that when you run it, so I could put a breakpoint here, for instance. Um, when I run the pet clinic application, you will see it's a debug. <clears throat> you will see it stop. There we go. So it stopped in the initializer, and I could. Um, step. Yep. So we are going to get a pet clinic application. We are going to get cash. We are going to get an owner controller, etc. So all of those beans get registered. And the same thing is happening now with all the Spring Boot auto configuration. Oh, look, I had another breakpoint that I didn't know about. So there's a actually in this is interesting. So in the um, dispatcher servlet configuration inside Spring Boot, there is this at configuration class, and it has an initializer. There's the initializer for that. And so my breakpoint has stopped me inside the factory factory method being called, basically. So the factory method is being called in the initializer um, because it had an at bean, but not because it's at configuration. It's not a pro configuration, configuration class proxy in the sort of normal sense. It's a, a functional bean registration all done in that case without reflection. Um, it starts up, there you go. So um, there's my pet clinic running. Um, how do I prove it? I guess, uh, how does pet clinic look? Find owners, is it running on port 8080? Do I have another breakpoint? I might do. Ah, there we go, okay. So there's the pet clinic. Betty Davis has Basil. The hamster, he's my favorite. Good, so um, that's your demo. What do you think? Awesome. Bob, what about you? Did you follow all that? I did. Uh, I appreciated Basil. Makes me think, of course, of Basil Faulty. Uh, <laughs> I'm like silently <laughs> clapping over here, but you can't see it. It's got kittens. We've got uh, we've got some attentive people on the other side. So some new names. I have uh, Wilson's JC. Welcome, Ruiz, Mori, Mori Ruiz, even. So yeah, we've got lots of people watching, which is nice. Thank you for staying up this late, Doctor. The sweet You're killer, welcome. sweet killer, of course. <laughs> Still here. That's not me. Yeah, right. We we deduced it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> uh well thank you so much we uh, uh yeah I, I i just really appreciate you you coming on the show and we're uh, it's always good to see you wish i wish i was seeing you in person somewhere around this oh, well, globe yeah. but uh that'll when be another time back to normal yeah <laughs> another time and that's okay one of these days yeah, yeah. don't come here they'll make you quarantine for two weeks 
Yeah, no, I'm, I've, uh, my, my coworkers need me here. So apparently I have to stay here. Right. Your little coworkers. <laughs> Plus I've got many more presents I have to give since I received so many yesterday <laughs> without giving any to my kids. <laughs> I wonder if you've, have, if someday we'll get presents that you'll be like, eh, don't know if I really want this. Oh, hey, I'll give it to my kid for their birthday. Well, yeah, that's uh regifting, right? Yeah. So, but that's hard. We, to regift inside the house is, is difficult as well as <laughs> super mean, I think. <laughs> Didn't, that reminds me of, uh, of uh, that movie where the guy like gives back the wedding present that they gave him. Didn't we give you that bread maker? It's like, yes, thank you. I love it. <laughs> anyway. It's so good. I got you on. <clears throat> <clears throat> So it was Cora saying, thanks for sharing all the history of spring day. Oh, Cora, Cora enjoyed the little trip down spring memory lane even. So lots of, uh, lots of good stuff, my friend. Uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer because I know it's, it's much later for you. So uh, unless oh, there's anything you, you want to plug, um, you know, we can let you no, go. I'm not plugging anything. All right. Well, we've got don't next week, in. we've got a show. <laughs> yeah. Don't come, don't, don't go to England and, uh, <laughs> Or if you Maybe do, you're going to quarantine on Dave's uh, couch for two weeks. <laughs> at, least, at least in the back garden, right? That's the couch behind me. That's yeah. <laughs> Put a tent in the backyard. Could do uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. That. <laughs> uh, next next week we have Brian Lyles, uh, who will be joining us. We're very excited to have him. Uh, he is going to be thinking out loud about Kubernetes, the workload configuration. So. Fortunately, he'll be thinking out loud with us while we're recording, so we can have that to share with everyone. Oh, we have a question. Uh, so, Wilson, oh. uh, where to register for the live presentation ahead? Uh, so, if you on Twitch, I think you can hit like subscribe or favorite or follow, and you'll uh, you'll get notified via email or whoever you like Twitch to notify you when something is happening. Uh, we do this Tuesday, uh, every Tuesday at one p.m. Pacific time. Uh, and then also we have other events uh, Bob mentioned at the top of the show, like uh, Spring Tour. Uh, and you can go to Spring Tour and uh, look at that. I think you can just Google Spring Tour and you'll find the URL. Uh, and then, of course, of course, yes, tanzu.tv is the place to go. Uh, you'll see all the back catalog of episodes and the next one or two episodes upcoming, depending on how. Uh, lazy we've been in actually putting Updating information our on website, the yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's user error. All right. Perfect. Well, cool. All right. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, Again, thanks for thank you us. all for, for joining us. So yeah. till next time. See you later. Bye. Stop. Uh, leave.